Welcome to the Female Founder Showcase uh, at SoundCalp. It's the second time that Cardio Women's Initiative organizes a Founder Showcase at SoundCalp. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Meng and I work at the Cardio Women's Initiative. It is a global program that supports women entrepreneurs leading early stage impact-driven businesses. So for each edition, we select 24 fellows from around the world, and we provide them with financial, social, and human capital support. Since um, the inception of the program in, 20, uh, in, two, in 2006, we have supported over 260 women impact entrepreneurs from over 60 countries, including many countries in Asia and Africa. Um, so I'm very glad to be joined today by six outstanding female founders who are our fellows. We'll have uh, Fariel and Sarah from Pakistan. We have Rebecca from the United States, Sinabu who's joined us from Mali, Caitlin from Kenya, and Mimi from Myanmar. Thank you um, for joining us. <clears throat> the entrepreneurs who are going to present today come from different places. They work in industries as diverse as agriculture, environmental services, healthcare, and culture. But they do have one thing in common. They are all female founders who have built a business with impact at its core. So today we'll invite each of them to take seven minutes to share about their company and then answer all your questions. So before we start, I just wanted to share some quick housekeeping rules. Um, please don't hesitate to type your questions and comments in the comment section during the session. And then please mute yourself to avoid background noise. And then last but not least, please don't forget to visit the virtual booth of our founders at the Sunco Global Summit. So after each presentation, we'll launch a quick poll um, so you can let us know if you're interested in learning more about uh, the business of our fellows. So without further ado, I will invite our first founder today to share about her company. Uh, her name is Fareel, and she is the founder and CEO of Uptrade from Pakistan. And Uptrade is a company that enables smallholder rural off-grid farming communities to meet their farming and household needs using livestock as currency. Her company also just launched its own meat line, Goats for Meat. So um, for real, please take it away. Thank you so much, Meng. Uh, I think you covered the introduction um, and it's great to be here. So my name is Fariel Salahuddin. I am the CEO and founder of Uptrade. Uptrade um, works with smallholder farmers in frontier economies, and we are enabling these farmers to use their livestock as currency to purchase key home assets, key productivity assets, which they can't afford in cash. I'm going to start with introducing you to, um, to our key customer. This is Imam Karo and his family. Uh, they live in a remote part of Pakistan in Thar. The family um, lives in a vill village which gets no access to electricity. The family earns about $70 a month, um, and they augment their income by selling their livestock each time they need cash. Imam Karo's biggest issue is his access to market. He would have to walk two hours nearby uh, to reach the market, and therefore, he re relies on middlemen to sell his animals. This, what we have found, is not just particular to far farmers in Pakistan, but smallholder farmers in countries like Tanzania and Uganda face similar hurdles. So to solve for this, um, we, have, we have launched two services. The first one is called uh, Goats for X, which is a barter model where farmers and households can exchange X number of goats for assets which they need for their homes and for their farms. We started with goats for water, where farmers exchanged goats to buy solar water pumps. We have launched solar home systems, and this year we are going to be launching smartphones. We also then uh, introduced an electronic marketplace, which is to address the fundamental issue of access to market. Here, farmers can exchange their votes for cash, where they get better values for their deal. 
So Just the market mean, that we work with globally comprises of 1.2 billion smallholder livestock families. These are families like Imam Karo's living in these dire conditions who can benefit from our work. The meat industry, which is the other end of the line where we sell the animals that we get, is a $1.3 trillion industry. Furthermore, we are specialized in halal meat, which in itself is $2 trillion. Our work touches six SDGs, starting with making key solar assets affordable for people who need them the most, providing access to lighting and to water. Our work around water and lighting impacts women because women bear the burden of providing water for their fa families and their home. With access to assets for water, we re reduce time poverty. Moreover, the high higher incomes also result in lower inequality poverty re reduction, and we aim to keep smallholder farmers central to the livestock value chain, which are rapidly being converted to factory farming models. So far, we have reached more than 10,000 farmers. Uh, we launched our app, which enables farmers to directly convert their animals to cash to know the value. We have launched our meat line uh, uh, literally two months ago, as Meng had st stated, uh, which allows us to export the meat. Uh, we are partnering with NGOs and microfinance banks on the ground to be able to reach a larger network of fa farmers. We have, we have done all of this with, with $140,000 that we, we have raised through accelerators, through Cartier, and through part partners. We are now looking to raise about $400,000 to $500,000 to reach our next goals, which is to expand to more farmers uh, and also to launch our meat line nationally, which we re require more marketing re resources. We would also like to focus on our te technology to develop it further and bring it directly into the hands of the f farmers. Our team comprises of primarily of uh, women. Um, these are just a few of my team members. We have now grown to about 14 team members. Um, I come from a background of uh, energy. Uh, my CFO, Sindhu, is, is an ACCA. And we have veterinarians and community members as key part of the team. I will now open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farrell. So um, just a quick reminder to our attendees today, please don't hesitate to um, put your questions and comments in the chat box. So um, while we wait for everybody to put in their questions, uh, I will invite Sankal to uh, share the quick poll with our attendees. Um, yeah. And then in the meantime, um, uh, I have some questions for you, Fariel. You said you, uh, you're working on six SDGs. Um, my question is, how are you assessing and measuring your impact in different SDG areas? Uh, so Meng, uh, this is something which we uh, learned very early on. We were very lucky to be part of the Spring Accelerator, which Sara is also a part of. and. Um, and so the way we measure is that we do a baseline at the beginning to understand what is happening in the village before we, before we come in. So we start with water. And then over the next few months, we look at the impact that water has brought around uh, on, on the lives of the women in terms of hours saved, in terms of the incomes as well. We have also now started looking at the incomes that are gained, additional income that are gained by farmers by using our e Monday model. Thank you, Faria. And <clears throat> I have a question from Sarah. So uh, using livestock as currency while engaging environmental action sounds like a very original, likely idea. What inspired you? Um, so I actually started my career um, with the 
development sector and i was i was looking at solar i was working at on very large uh, grid connected solar pro projects and um, what i found was that while we are bringing el electricity to the to to the urban areas um, what i found was that this was not being translated to to the communities that are living in remote parts of the country um, and then the biggest hurdle for them was affordability and affordability in cash was something which was stopping them from being able to buy assets so it was really serendipitous and literally the idea just came out of the sky uh, where you know i saw a herd of animals crossing and i said well they have a lot of goats maybe they can you know give us goats instead of cash which they agreed to and that's how it started so goats for water is the the first one and then uh, it, it depends to it will expand to other areas right you're launching your meat line and then you mentioned smartphones in the future etc Yes, so we've already done uh, solar water pumps, we're doing solar lighting, solar fans, um, and we want to go into smartphones now because we feel that technology will really be able to leapfrog these communities from, you know, from, from the past into the future. Thank you, Fariel. And I've got another question. Um, what are the challenges in communicating on uh, what your business is with the farmers? What channels did you rely on to reach those farmers? Um, that's a really uh, great question. Uh, I started with first uh, going into the field myself. Then I started with uh, partners. Then now we have our own team of agents who go into the field and communicate our work. And now it's a combination of partners and our own team members who reach out to new communities and new customers. Great. And uh, I have one last question for you, Fareel. Um, and you mentioned um, fundraising, but apart from that, um, what are your other asks um, to all the attendees who are attending our session today? Yeah, um, so one of my asks is that I would like to um, hold on here as an ask. So I'm actually looking for tech expertise. We are looking for blockchain experts whom we can work with, bring on board, partner with, because we'd like to bring on board um, food traceability. We uh -huh. are also looking for networks in other countries where we can expand our model, uh, but that's still maybe a year down the line. What we're immediately look, looking for is, is someone who can connect us to, to blockchain experts. Wonderful. And there are some blockchain experts in the Cardi Women's Initial Community, so I'll, I'll definitely make the connection. And actually, before I invite our second founder, Rebecca, to, to speak, I just got a, another question from YJ. How uh, did you build up your startup team? Um, so we got our first bit of funding, which allowed me to hire just, we started with the operations first. The first people I hired were on the ground operations. Um, that was key. Um, and then I focused on the selling side slowly. It was a balance between building the operational team and then the marketing side. Uh, and then the finance, of course, the internal company operations. Thank you, Fariel. Well, thank you so much for um, all your answers and the great presentation. So please stay on, on the call because um, while we um, go into the session, you might receive other questions from our attendees. So um, if you want to connect with Fariel, please don't hesitate to send her a quick message on the chat directly. And maybe Fariel, you could also share uh, your email address or social media channels with our attendees. I will do that. I'm just going to put my email address. Thank you. Thank you, Fariel. And next up, I'll invite uh, you, from my, um, Maya. <clears throat> Maya is a company based in Mali. It's a food processing company um, which is specialized in grocery store products using an inclusive models through partnership with farmers in Mali. Um, and actually, Sinabu is also our first fellow from Mali. So welcome, Sinabu. Thank you. Thank you, Meng. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm very happy to be here uh, today on the South Sun platform. 
and uh, to share a little bit about what we are doing here in West Africa uh, in terms of impact uh, with farmers. Uh, so if you let me, I will share my screen. Um, please. Yeah, it's okay. Can you see it? Yes. All right. So um, I have uh, something to ask you. Do you know Africa is one of, West Africa is the special place where uh, most of the food that we eat come from elsewhere. Uh, I know it's very special for, for people around the world to, to learn that, but this is what a West African uh, supermarket looks like. So basically uh, we have been neg neglecting our farmers and uh, everything that is uh, harvested locally uh, for imported food and imported raw material. Um, Forty percent of uh, the West African ECOWAS food is imported from abroad. Uh, it can be Europe, Asia, or the United States, uh, creating an unfair competition against our local producers. Uh, we have a lot of highly manufactured food coming from abroad. Uh, usually, it's low quality food, and it impacted uh, people's health and well-being. What we are trying to do at Maya is quite simple. We just wanna uh, create a brand that is reconnecting uh, what is found with the farmers and um, uh, the local markets. So we have launched this uh, local brand of food product products using uh, especially uh, local raw material, which are grown locally. Uh, and still guarantee the consumer ease of use, quality, and attractivity, like all the forex brand does. Uh, so in the meantime, we want to make sure that the products uh, benefits to the farmers, that we meet the consumer's taste and expectations and well-being. Uh, our company also uh, has an impact on the post-harvest post losses that are drastically reduced. Uh, because we do contracting with farmers, uh, we employ youth young people, and um, we feel like we make people proud and confident to uh, what we can have locally. So our mission is, is quite simple. We wanna reconnect the African consumer with locally ground and processed food. Doing this, we have been uh, touching four um, impacts uh, like responsible consumption and production, uh, no poverty, decent work and economic growth, and of course, gender equality, because we hire 80% uh, of our staff is our women. We are very proud uh, in four years to have 175 point of sales uh, in four West African countries. We've been working with 3,000 farmers uh, in 11 farmers associations in Mali in different raw materials. And 20% of the revenue of the company goes directly to the farmer, which is a great opportunity for them. We have two, two ranges of products. The first range is a local range inspired by uh, Senegalese and West African gastronomy. So of course, it's a, it's a sophisticated uh, brand of food uh, that we sell in supermarkets, specialty stores and e-commerce. Uh, and it's uh, fully dedicated to uh, niche markets in West Africa and also the West African diaspora um, in Europe, uh, especially. Uh, so this is uh, some of our products. For example, we have the baobab powder. I don't know if you know that uh, the baobab tree uh, offers a very great fruit, which is the baobab fruit. And you can drink it or add it to, uh, to juices. It's very nutritive. Uh, we also have vegetable broths made with local spices. Uh, like in, uh, in Asia and in India, we, we, we like to eat chili. So we, we have fresh chili and garlic sauce. Uh, we have donut mixes. Well, everything that uh, can go in, uh, in West African uh, recipes. In the meantime, we have developed a, a range of nutritional products dedicated to all around the world because those are gluten-free products, 100% organic products. Uh, that are made with whole seed foods and spices. Uh, so we have high nutritional values. Uh, uh, you can consume it from all around the world and um, the vegan market can be very much interested in those products. So it's basically cereals like fonio, like millet, etc. 
and also uh, foods like baobab powders and some spices. So here they are. Uh, the market that we are targeting is quite big because uh, you have almost $4 billion uh, market uh, that we can reach. Of course, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we will be able to service only $75 million of that market. But in the, um, what we can do in three years, we can uh, offer $10 million product value uh, on the West African market and also on the export market. We rely on high competitive advantages because we have uh, a mix of our own processing technology, uh, mixing traditional and modern techniques. So our factory is a semi-artisanal uh, uh, factory. Uh, this allows us to have a customized uh, and better taste and texture for our products. Uh, we have years of experience uh, sourcing raw materials from all around West Africa and building partnership with farmers, which give us cheaper raw material and uh, best quality. And we have a big head start on, uh, on packaging uh, for a better quality again and ease of use. Um, yeah, so I think this is basically what we wanted to share. Uh, in terms of investing, uh, there is a slide missing. We are looking forward to raise uh, $1 million to build a big factory in uh, West Africa, Senegal. Uh, which will um, be a cereal and spices factory for the local market and also for the international market. So we are very happy to connect with any partner, uh, financial or technical partner that are interested in sourcing uh, uh, West African food, uh, cereals and nutritional food also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sinabu. Thank you very much. And uh, oh, we've already got a question from Goldfree. Actually, I have us have the same question about export. So, what percentage do you export? Do you expect to um, to export your products to Europe? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, since we have been starting the business for only for four years now, uh, we have exported forty percent of our production, but in West Africa. So, we are based in Mali, but the company already exports in three other West African countries. But of course, uh, if the company goes bigger and we build the factory that we are seeking to build, we will be able to source, uh, uh, I mean, to, to, to export to other parts of the world. Thank you, Sinem. What about working with, for example, uh, major supermarket chains? Have you considered yes. yes, we already do that because, you know, uh, West Africa is, uh, we, we highly rely on French partnerships. So we have French uh, supermarkets like Auchan, uh, Carrefour are already uh, distributing our products. Uh, so which, um, which will uh, ease for me uh, the next steps would, will be to, to go to, to, to those big channels uh, uh, in, uh, in other countries. So we are already been working with uh, the big distribution and uh, we are doing great, I think. That's wonderful. And mm -hmm. second question, are there stereotypes about developing a business in West Africa that you think can hinder entrepreneurship and encourage relying on imported food, do you hope Maya can serve as a role model for other entrepreneurs in Mali and the region? Thank you for the question. Uh, this is basically what Maya is all about. You know, uh, we know that, you know, changing the mindset of all West Africans going to, uh, to, to eating local food, it's something that is maybe too tough for us to do, but we wanna show other entrepreneurs and everyone that it's possible to do it because we have the whole material. We just need to have the, um, the ambition, I would say, and also to, 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 to learn about you know, our, companies, our country's economics because in countries like Mali, 75% of people depend on agriculture. So if agri uh, farmers don't have any opportunity, we will, be, uh, uh, we will still be considered as poor countries because we need to take those 75% of the population out of poverty. So uh, it's a very nice question because uh, uh, it, it touches my, uh, my mission for this company. <laughs> yeah, that's thank very you. well said. And thank you, Mabinti, for, for both of your questions. So what are your other sources of capital? What type of investors are you seeking? And the second question is, how is Maya improving access to job opportunities for women? Yes, so thank you for the questions. Um, we have raised uh, around the 
300 to $350,000 since the beginning of the company, both in grants uh, and also VC. So we already have an investor in our capital. So we are open to capital investments, of course, uh, because we know that the, um, we need technical assistance. We need uh, a business consulting. We also need assistance in, uh, in the distribution and to, to reach other markets. So we are very, very much open to, 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 to all kind of uh, partnership because like I said earlier, we want to uh, offer more opportunities to, to those farmers that we have been contracting with. So the more product we can produce, the more product we can buy for them from them, the better it is for the company. Uh, so our, our way of improving access to, to, to job opportunities for women is quite simple. Uh, you know, here, everything that is related to food is, uh, is like for women. Uh, we have a lot of, um, lot of schools uh, training women how to do and how to process food. But unfortunately, those women, they are not unable to, to build their own company. So we uh, hire from those schools and those women that have been trained on food processing techniques those are the women that we take. It's not people that have a high degrees, uh, for example. Some people just uh, are in elementary school. Some of them don't even know how to write, but we take them and we train them again uh, to give them uh, empowerment and, uh, and a decent life, I would say. I think that's um, all what impact entrepreneurship is about. So thank you again, um, Sinabu. Thank you. For vision and for all your answers. So please stay online. Um, and um, oh, Mabinti, thanks you for your responses. Uh -huh. So that's thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sinabu. And please stay online. And uh, maybe there will be other questions for you um, during the session, during the rest of the session. Um, thank you. Next up, I would like to welcome Sarah Saeed, um, one of our fellows from Pakistan as well. So she is the founder of Sihat Kahani and her company is democratizing healthcare by building an all female health provider network to deliver quality healthcare solutions using telehealth. Um, please, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Sara Saeed Khuram and I come from Pakistan. And um, the, the company that I've created, it's called Sehat Kahani for everyone's uh, easiness. Sehat means health in Urdu and Kahani means story. So we're particularly trying to change the way health stories are written in Pakistan. Uh, the company is created by me and my co-founder and we are both medical doctors by profession. We were not friends when we started the company, but we shared a common pain that is felt by a lot of female doctors in our country. So Pakistan has a medical workforce of 200,000 doctors and a population of 200 million people. Out of these 200,000 doctors, 63% or more are female doctors. So clearly women are in a majority in the country. However, due to social cultural pressures and because how the country is built, a lot of female doctors are not allowed to practice after graduation. Either they leave it on their own or they settle down becoming homemakers or mothers. And generally a woman working in Pakistan is not appreciated or, or looked down upon. Now, what it does to a woman doctor is after graduation, she's not able to practice. So around 85,000 female doctors in Pakistan never work. Additionally, more doctors leave the country for better work opportunities. So in actuality, in Pakistan, there's one doctor for 1,700 patients. And what it does, like, what it does for a country like Pakistan, where there is, which is the fifth largest population of the world, is that it really impacts our health indicators. So Pakistan is 154th out of 195 countries in terms of accessibility to healthcare. All the issues that can be prevented at a primary healthcare level don't happen because of absence of doctors and quality health professionals at the poorest or the rural income communities. So Pakistan has the highest rate of breast cancer in Asia, where the second worst country for newborns to be born a woman dies every 37 minutes due to pregnancy in our country and 40% of our future is stunted. We have an extremely high fertility rate as well. Again, all these issues can be prevented at a primary healthcare level, but there is a significant doctor-patient mismatch in Pakistan. 
I remember when I was a medical doctor, I also wasn't able to practice after having the birth of my first child. And this is when I heard the term Dr. Bright. There's actually a term for it. So me, along with 85,000 doctors, suffer from the Dr. Bright phenomena. So what does Sehat Kahani do? Sehat Kahani uses um, a silver lining in this challenge. So Pakistan is also one of the populations in the, in the world where internet penetration has been extremely strong, where half of our population is not able to access healthcare. 98 million people, almost half of the population, has access to smartphones now. And telecommunication industry in Pakistan is growing, especially post-COVID. So what Sehat Kahani does is uses the power of technology to connect female doctors from their homes to patients who need healthcare using a telemedicine-based solution. We figured that if a doctor cannot teach a patient, we need to bring the patient to the doctor using an audio, video, and chat-enabled platform. And while we do this, we realize that the market for telemedicine has boomed in the last five years, making it a $202 billion industry by 2027. So today, Sehat Kahani connects a large network of female doctors to patients using a telemedicine platform that is used in three ways. So in low-income communities where patients don't have access to smartphones and they prefer traditional methods of care, there we create brick and mortar clinics where nurses are sitting and they're given a telemedicine solution through which they connect the patient to an online doctor who can be placed anywhere in the world. For smartphone users, we have a mobile application that does the same, but takes out the nurse from the picture. So in the smartphone application, the patient is able to connect to a doctor directly. And this is usually used for urban users or users that have access to smartphones. And with both our solutions, we also have a 24 seven helpline that allows anyone to connect to a doctor, even from their feature or their butter phone as well, which is usually used by other half of the population in Pakistan, which doesn't access smartphones. Particularly, our mobile application in the, in the recent one year has grown. And we use this mobile application for two markets. So it can be used through a B2B channel where we give it to corporates who take this solution for their employees. Or we also use it for a retail consumer, which can use it directly using their smartphone. When a patient comes to a clinic in a low-income community, they're greeted by a nurse. The nurse takes their history and examination and connects them to an online doctor. And a prescription is printed at the clinic. On the mobile application, which an urban user uses, they can connect to the application directly. They'll find a list of doctors available. They can do a video consultation with the doctor and a prescription will be available in their smartphone. We connect all these three models through revenue lines. So in our clinics, we charge fee per user. In our corporate mobile application, we charge a subscription-based annual model from the corporates, which ranges between $5 to $50. And on the B2C, which is the retail application, patients can pay through subscription plans or they can pay fee per user as well. Sehat Kahani in the last five years have grown to a, one of the largest telemedicine companies in Pakistan. We have a network of 35 clinics across Pakistan in low-income communities. We service employees of 753 corporations today through individual accounts as well as insurance partners. We've done over half a million consultations till date, and overall we cover 7.8 million people through our corporate and retail application. We've also grown a network of 5,000 female doctors all across the world. 81% of these doctors are in Pakistan, but 19% also are international. We've also worked a lot with government in COVID-19. We've worked with federal governments and provincial governments to make sure that patients in COVID-19 can access quality healthcare using Sehat Kahani telemedicine app. We work with a large range of corporate providers today, one of the best in Pakistan, ranging from banks, pharmaceutical companies, and other insurance partners to disseminate our services through our mobile application as well as integrating through theirs. We have a team of 133 people today. I'm very glad that 75% of our female of our team has female leadership. Sehat Kahani is also the first female-led company in Pakistan to raise a pre-series A round of $1 million. And right now, we're trying to raise a series A round, which will help us to further expand our mobile application in B2B and B2C markets, and also launch more clinics in public-private partnerships. In the next five years, Sehat Kahani envisions to bring back 50,000 female doctors back into the workforce and also experiment the solution in other countries where there are similar health issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah.
Thank you. And there's already um, quite some messages in the comment box. Arvashi said, this is really inspiring work. It should be scaled globally. And Nikita um, also said, totally agree. In fact, I would like to discuss with Sarah about transferring this solution to Afghanistan for a USA um, funded project. So, um, so I think I have a question for you, Sarah. You mentioned geographically expand your company's impact to other countries. Do you have um, do you have any concrete plans in terms of countries or regions that you want to reach next? Yeah, I think at this point, while we raise our Series A round, our biggest target is to disseminate our services across Pakistan. We're trying to increase our B2C and B2B mobile application access in the urban markets and also our public private partnerships through government in launching more clinics. I think post our Series A fundraise, when we have sufficient funds, um, I would try to reach one of the three geographies that I uh, normally mention. One is Afghanistan that someone mentioned because uh, there's a massive health crisis there. And I think telemedicine can be a solution that can be easily expanded there. Second is Bangladesh. And third is the MENA region because there are huge refugee settlements there. Um, in Bangladesh, there's a doctor-patient mismatch as well. And because of religious and cultural similarities, I think this model can be replicated um, through B2B or B2C agents. Um, so definitely there's a plan of expansion outside Pakistan. Very exciting. Um, and then we have another question. Um, Sehat Khan addresses such a challenging issue and surely you must have faced many obstacles in terms of culture, access, digital literacy, et cetera. Are there any key strategies or alliances that you would say were critical to your success? Yeah. I think the clinical model when we started uh, convincing a low income population where people have never seen a doctor on a video call was extremely difficult. So our major champion and our alliance was with nurses working in the community um, already. So we didn't create clinics from scratch. We partnered with nurses, upgraded their clinics and used their strength to get patients into the clinic. When we started with this difficult solution, when we transferred it to the urban market, we already had learnings from all the difficult challenges that we face in our clinics. So then when we, raised, when we reached to the urban user, we realized that the one thing that worked most in our clinics is that patients did not have to wait to see a doctor. So in our mobile application that works uh, in urban market in Pakistan, you get connected to a doctor in less than 60 seconds through an instant wow. consultation. And that really ha has helped us get, 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 helped us get maximum number of users uh, in the last two years, especially post COVID. So these are one of the two strategies that worked. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. And then I have a question about the ecosystem in Pakistan in general. And do you think Pakistan has changed as a society in terms of um, accepting career-oriented women? And what needs to be to, to, to be changed to help more women move forward um, um, career-wise? I think things have moved forward in a positive direction. I see much more women working uh, in my generation and post my generation, as I used to see in the generation before me or my mother's generation. But I think there's a lot to be done. I think what will change this narrative is normality. When we see more mm -hmm. women educating themselves and coming into the workforce and working, that is when people will see it as a normality and not as an abrupt change from their usual uh, way of seeing women as homemakers. So we need more and more women to work in Pakistan, to create their companies, to lead their businesses, and really sit at tables, important decision-making tables, whether it is boardroom, whether it is government committees, whether it's entrepreneurial committees, we need a female voice everywhere, not just because she's a, a female face in a male panel, but actually having her views being expressed as a key member of that discussion. And that is when we see things, be, things really starting to change. Thank you, Sarah. That's extremely well said. I think that's also the mission of the Cardi Women's Initiative. We also need more women like you to elevate other women and um, make their voices heard. So um, thank you, Sarah, for your presentation and for all your answers. And uh, just um, a quick note to Nikita. So if you're interested in discussing partnership with Sarah, please don't hesitate to reach out to her directly on these chats. Um, and Sarah, maybe you can also share, for example, your social media channels or contact details for people to connect with you afterwards. Sure, definitely. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And next up, I'd like to um, invite our fellow Caitlin Dolkart from uh, Kenya to share about her company. Meng, Meng you're muted. 
Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I was muted, but uh, I wanted to in, in introduce, introduce you to Caitlin. So Caitlin is the founder of Flare, uh, and Flare is building innovative life-saving emergency response products for Africa. Take it away, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Meng, and thank you, Cartier, for inviting me. Um, I have a tough act to follow. There's so many inspiring companies that Cartier has supported. So I am Caitlin Dolkart. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm one of the founders at Flare. In, in, most, in many parts of the world, the numbers 911 and 999 signify health. And oftentimes it signifies hope. You may be sitting in a city or a country where those you know, three digits exist, uh, but that's not the case in Africa. When we started in Kenya, it used to take three hours to get an ambulance. And that's you know, hours too long. Um, since 2017, we've launched and built a nationwide platform that today has given access to more than a million people in Kenya, and we're providing response times as fast as two minutes. How do we do it? Is the way we do it is through one button, meaning one number, one touch of a button to access thousands of services. So while there was no centralized system, there's actually thousands of providers of ambulances, roadside security, response, which we've connected on our platform, and to ultimately impact billions of lives. The majority of the world, 66% 66 of the world, or over 5 billion people, live in parts where there is no access to emergency care and health. So the way, if we look at this, though, as a problem, you know, that's the wrong way to look at it. We look at it as an opportunity space. When we started in Kenya, we thought this was so niche and so specific to Kenya, but in reality, it's not at all. So 98 countries around the world lack functioning 911 or 999 system. In Africa, that's 47 out of the 54 countries do not have a functioning emergency response system. And what we're specifically looking at is growing to the next five countries in the next two years, which we estimate as over $10 million in a clear line of sight of revenue. The way that our model actually works today is that companies, organizations, individuals, governments subscribe to our service. So they sign up to ensure that their employees, their clients, their constituents have access to emergency services. And so you can see the broad range of clients that we have given access um, to emergency services. And today we have over 200,000 paying subscribers on our platforms from some of the largest multinationals to you know, government partners in Kenya as well. And we're just reaching only 1% of Kenya's population. And, and target users. And so there's so much opportunity, even within Kenya, to continue to grow, despite the massive kind of traction and gains that we've made over the last several years. So let me tell you a little bit about how the platform works. From its core, we are a cloud-based smart technology. Uh, we would only be able to do what we, we can because of our tech. And we have multiple different apps that act, interact in the background um, to make everything possible. So our clients or users, either have a single phone number to call or they or we integrate with other um, apps. So for example, we're showing here Bolt, which is one of our customers, we integrate directly on their app. So with a touch of a button, they can reach emergency services. Individuals subscribe or corporate subscribe on a digital platform. So that's all done digitally. Um, so we do not collect any paperwork at Flare. Everything is done kind of automatically in the cloud. Back at our dispatch center, this is where all the requests come in we're able to see where all the responders are located throughout the country and with the touch of the button dispatch them. The responder app is in our you know, fleets of ambulances. This allows ambulances to get to the scene quickly on time uh, and save that life. And finally, for hospitals and doctors, we have a portal that they can book for ambulances as well, making it easy access you know, to get from one facility to the next. So where we're going is that uh, this is the kind of our footprint over the last um, several years. So we have done emergency transfers actually already across the continent using airplanes, um, but we are looking to expand our footprint into five countries in the next two years and have a clear line of sight to that $10 million in revenue. I'm supported by an incredible team. We're spread across the world with majority based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, we have dispatchers, we have software engineers, we have people that um, specialize in operations, and only through that kind of collaboration and kind of diversity of team are we able to ultimately deliver a end-to-end -end solution. 
So let's look at the impact. Impact is at the core of what we do. Um, impact is measured in every single case, but is also measured kind of more broadly. Uh, so when we look at actually the total impact, emergencies, you may be thinking like, I've never had an emergency and, and, and that's great, but actually um, emergencies are one of the leading causes of death in the world. Um, and it disproportionately affects countries like Kenya where you don't have an emergency response system. So there's over 8.6 million deaths that can be averted every single year simply if you had a solution like that. Uh, but we also, beyond just kind of impacting, you know, the end patient, is we are impacting businesses, is that these businesses existed prior to us and we're empowering them to actually have sustainable livelihoods, is that all of the ambulances or security responders or tow trucks on our platform, they're not ours. So that's why we're oftentimes called Uber you know, for emergency response is that we are enabling them to thrive. And all of our responders have seen increases in revenue and have been able to grow their businesses as, as part of being on our system. So just some quick numbers to kind of recap and finish off the presentation. 66% of the world still does not have 911. That's 5 billion people. To date, we've done over 9,000 life-saving rescues and, and saved that many lives. And our fastest response time to date has been two minutes. Um, previously, before us, it was 162 minutes. So that's 160 minutes faster. So thank you so much um, and happy to answer kind of any questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's impressive what you have achieved. And while we wait for more questions to come, I, I do have some questions for you. So um, can, can we say that your company provides um, a kind of a software infrastructure that centralizes ambulance dispatch and also connects um, Kenyans to life-saving services? I would say that's spot on, Ming, is that we are a digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that because we operate in emergency services, there is a service component to it. So it's not just pure tech. Um, I think with healthcare, everyone can agree that you need that human kind of to deliver ultimately the care. So humans are at the center of our solution as well. Thank you, Caitlin. And um, Carly has a question for you. What is the timeline of your company growth and investments? Um, so we, yeah, we launched in 2017. We've raised three different separate rounds for post series A. Um, so we are backed by institutional investors, VCs, impact investors. So a really solid, you know, network of, I think we have over 30 investors who have backed us today. Um, we are raising around, so please do get in touch if you are interested in kind of supporting our growth across the continent. Yep. Please um, don't hesitate to contact Caitlin directly on this chat. Uh, and I think Caitlin afterwards will also share her contact details or social media uh, channels for you to connect with her. And uh, Caitlin, you mentioned that you're um, planning to expand to five um, more countries in Africa and you're working a lot with corporate organizations. And I was wondering what about public um, service institutions or governments? Um, do you have any plans to work with, with them? We do. Um, we're completely agnostic as it relates to working with the private or the public. Our technology and solution works regardless of where the care is ultimately delivered. Um, I think that what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of countries across the continent have much stronger private sectors, or that's where mm -hmm. ambulances exist. Um, but there are certain countries like Rwanda where we're targeting that is a much um, heavier public a sector um, healthcare system. And so in, the, in that situation, we would work with the existing resources. Our goal is to assemble the fragmented, uncoordinated, you know, mm -hmm. system that exists regardless of if it's public ambulances, private ambulances, um, to de ultimately deliver that public good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically to leverage um, technology to make the whole thing much, much more efficient. Exactly. Great, and then uh, we've got another question. How did you go about communicating on Flare and how were you able to help people to trust you since your initiative was very new in the region? Did it help that you were relying on existing infrastructure? Yeah, that's a many, many ways to answer that question. Um, I think that what we did initially is we did start working with corporates at first. Um, that was a way for us to gain scale rather than kind of go individually um, like B2C. Uh, so that allowed us to gain some credibility. But I think that ultimately 
what has allowed us to grow. We've never done marketing. Um, so we spent zero dollars on marketing, which is a huge testament to our service, yes. is, to, is to ensure that our service actually works. Um, so we spent years perfecting it. You know, the operational protocols, the technology, it's one of those services that you cannot mess up. It's very different if you don't deliver a pizza on time and the customer is unhappy because the pizza is cold. It's a completely different scenario, as you can imagine, if an ambulance arrives late. Um, so operational excellence is, is core to our actual service. And, and we don't, yeah, so we have intentionally not scaled as fast as we could. Thank you, Kitley. And you also mentioned like impact measurements. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that. So what kind of impact areas are you measuring and what are the metrics that you're using to, to measure them? Yeah, so we measure impact in a number of different ways. I think the, the um, being a technology company at its core, like we have data points on everything. Um, so data is never a problem. It's never as if it, we have to do a separate exercise to collect data. We have data that drives every decision that we make. Um, but I guess simply put, the way that we look at impact is a, an individual case story, whether it's, you know, a woman who was delivering twins, you know, at home that our dispatcher was able to guide over the phone how to successfully deliver the twins and they survived and getting the ambulance there to transfer um, them to the hospital. So we look at those individual cases and studies. And I mean, we've had thousands of patent, thousands of su successful rescues, but then mm -hmm. we also look at, you know, kind of globally, where are we tracking and where are we trending? Um, so we kind of do it both at a macro and a super micro level so that we never get too far away from the actual individual that we're impacting. That sounds a very comprehensive approach. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And um, yeah, and to our attendees, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the comment box and Caitlin will be online to answer them. So thank you once again, Caitlin. And uh, next up, I'd like to invite our last um, uh, founder to present today. Her name is Mimi Wu, and she is the co-founder and CEO of Myanmar um, Recycles from Myanmar. So Myanmar Recycles is providing an industrial scale solution to the country's plastic pollution problem. So I invite uh, Mimi to share a little bit more about her company. Thank you so much, Meng. Um, let me share my screen. Sign up. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, so thank you so much uh, for everyone for being here and thank you again to Cartier Women's Initiative for inviting me. I'm Mimi Wu, I'm co-founder and CEO of Myanmar Recycles. And at my, Myanmar Recycles, we collect and recycle traditionally ignored, hard to recycle plastic bags. And this is what really sets us apart um, from other global companies. And I forgot to, let me just say, I preemptively apologize if any cats, I've, there are two cats here, if any of them can or make any noise, excuse their uh, presence. Um, okay, so worldwide, a million plastic bags are distributed every minute. What about the waste? In Myanmar, almost 80 million plastic bags are discarded every day, and the majority is improperly disposed of. Because of weak waste management systems, Southeast Asia in general is the most plastic polluting region in the world. And that results in high plastic leakage into oceans. Myanmar is a major contributor. In 2009, it had the ninth most polluted river in the world, and that, fed, and that feeds directly into the Indian Ocean. Unfortunately, our global recycling industry finds collecting and recycling plastic bags too difficult. And thus, a lot of people resort to burning plastics, which releases toxic fumes, or dumping them in waterways, which pollutes drinking water and threatens all life. So in other words, this plastic pollution crisis is not only causing huge environmental damage, but it also has devastating global health consequences as well. Our vision is a zero plastic waste future, and our solution transforms a linear life cycle of plastic into a circular one, and that results in a sustainable, scalable model with tangible environmental impacts. Our company starts by collecting discarded plastic bags ourselves, as well as purchasing from aggregators. It undergoes a series of intensive washing machines and then is melted down and cut into pellets. And these pellets are packaged and sold to manufacturers wanting to make new plastic products. Um, so let me just show you what that looks like, just so you have a visual.
Okay. So um, our finished product, as I said, is the plastic pellet. And that's what it looks like. Um, we have an installed capacity of 2,400 tons per year. And next year, we're looking to acquire ocean-bound plastic certification and global stand recycling standard certification, both of which will allow us to enter new sales markets with conscientious buyers, particularly in Europe, um, that can command higher sales prices that sometimes exceed new plastic pellets. We're also on track to become accredited for 3RI and Bureau's Global Plastic Credits Program, which allows us to earn revenue from each ton recycled and will transform our economic model and ability to scale. So plastic film is a nearly $200 billion global market, um, and it has a $40 billion recycled, recycled plastic market. Packaging is the fastest growing end use market of recycled plastics, and that's what our product really goes into. Um, we have a targeted market of $14 billion focused in the Asia Pacific region, particularly within Myanmar, um, our, China, our neighbors, China and India and Australia. And we also look towards Europe as their changing regulations require increased use of recycled plastic. So depicted through the green line, our competitive strength lies in our technical expertise of washing, um, particularly dirty plastics, post-consumer film. Um, and that's compared to not only um, within Myanmar, but also regionally. We also have strong ENS compliance, which has led to supply, sorry about the cats, um, that is secured by Myanmar's local and national governments. And we are becoming a partner of choice um, for brands in Myanmar. So while we lag behind in volume compared to regional recyclers, we're actively fundraising to increase the production capacity. And these competitive advantages have actually translated into revenue um, since we've been fully operational, which was in January 2018. And we've been able to achieve a positive gross profit in 2020, as well as seeing the best gross profit margin in company's history this past January. Uh, post fundraising, we're going to ramp up domestic collection to match our continuing product line growth and gain accreditation for our products and processes, which will lead to a strong and well rounded company. So our um, to date, we have directly engaged over 230 collectors and purchased from over 60 aggregators who altogether represent about at least 800 livelihoods impacted. We've recovered and recycled. Um, over 800, uh, sorry, 1800 tons of plastic bags. And this has been made possible by our all local team, of which 55% are female. As we expand, we anticipate creating hundreds more jobs in collection and transportation. Um, in addition, we're fully compliant with uh, local regulations, um, which is quite rare in Myanmar actually. And we promote SGD, SGDs uh, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, mostly focused on industry and environment. Um, now, kind of the elephant in the room, um, unfortunately, um, but on February 1st of this year, Myanmar's military staged a coup and there was an initial shock and disruption, um, but which led to limitations on banking um, as well as transportation, definitely um, unrest in in cities and in rural areas. Um, and, and it's been coupled with the COVID outbreak that's really exacerbated the situation. But since Q3 of this year, we've actually seen a huge return to normalcy. We're quite optimistic about the um, outlook. Um, and also we see a continued currency depreciation into 2022, which actually means any funding will automatically go further and exports then become more competitive. So our key members, myself and Henry, we co-founded the company, and we have a director, um, Kevin, who helps support our business development as well. Um, we are fundraising for $1 million, and um, that will help to expand our supply networks, grow our management team, gain the certifications I spoke of earlier, and purchase pieces of equipment that will help to double our production capacity. Um, plastic credits will especially help us achieve this fundraising goal. Um, and, you know, we're looking for any support, equity, loans, grants, et cetera. So thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Amy.
And we've, we've already got some questions. And uh, I just wanted to um, ask, I, I, I read in an interview that you are among um, the first to take part in a global plastic cred credit system. Mm -hmm. Can you please share a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 3R, the 3R initiative has been spearheaded by Vera, who um, you all may know um, as a leading um, standard for the carbon credits market, actually. So they've put forth their the model and put it into a plastic credits model. And so what that means is they're connecting um, companies like myself who are collecting and recycling really hard to recycle plastics um, and connecting us with companies such as Coca-Cola, Unilever, basically companies that are dependent on plastic packaging to help mm -hmm. offset their plastic use. And while these schemes exist right now, um, they're only within countries. So um, they're typically known as EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. Um, this model allows us to tap and will expand the market into a global setting and be able to tap into the funding that's available, um, especially places like Southeast Asia, which don't have EPR schemes, um, mm -hmm. but do so much of the production and have so much waste as well. So it's just a way for us to share with that, share into that. Mm -hmm. That's and, great. And, so yeah. Sorry, uh, they just launched the um, standard this uh, earlier this year. And so we're becoming accredited with them um, through Lloyd's Register to say, yes, your company does do the things you're saying and we will match, you know, and then we match with a potential buyer. That's that's great. So basically it, it could direct financing from those corporations to help your company expand its, its capacity, right? And fulfill its, its, its missions. Absolutely. That's a much more succinct way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, great. And then uh, I've got a question on here. Oh, Larry said, great initiative. I'd appreciate a consideration for a partnership with Myanmar. So great. please don't hesitate to reach out to Mimi directly. Yes. Oops. Sorry. Okay. I have this up, don't I? Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. You also sorry. have the email I... addresses here. Okay. Yes. Is oh, that or a... Mimi, you can copy paste your email address um, in the Perfect. chat. Perfect. I will do that. Yeah, and um, Eric, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And then we've got another question from Sarah. Despite the challenges you mentioned, your business could be seen as a testimony to the fact that sustainable does not mean non-profitable. Do you mm -hmm. see entrepreneurs in Myanmar or the region follow in your footsteps and launch their own sustainable businesses? Yeah, um, definitely in this space. So we were selected by the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which is a, a huge, it's like a 50 member um, nonprofit that is really dedicated to eradicating plastic pollution. And we were selected for the Singapore um, Accelerator Program in, in August 2020, along with, I think, 10 other organization, er, companies um, from the region who are three of us um, four of us actually are working on hard to recycle plastics, collecting them and recycling them. That was in um, India, Indonesia, and in um, the Philippines, you know, all places that have really high, unfortunately, high plastic pollution and really kind of weak waste management systems. So we're able to share with, share with each other um, kind of the lessons learned. And we are looking hopefully to scale. I mean, what we're doing now a lot of, as I was saying, it's a it's a problem in Southeast Asia. It's a problem all over the world. But we do share a lot of similar systems, some culture even, um, and waste kind of um, population um, with other Southeast Asian countries. So we're looking: are we able to kind of replicate this in other places? We're looking at that strongly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you also mentioned China, India, Australia, and many other countries, right? In a yeah, those are definitely our end markets. Mm -hmm. um, with regulations, new regulations, they China and India are no longer recycling so much, or, well, they're actually trying to expand a little bit of their recycling, but and focusing on post-consumer. So hopefully mm -hmm. those regulations of not allowing imported um, plastic into mm -hmm. those countries will actually spur um, domestic companies to take a look at the post-consumer plastic, which is, as yeah. I said, super hard to recycle, highly ignored. Yeah, great. And um, Ariel has a question for you. In East Africa, we have seen strict bans on plastic mm -hmm. bags, which have impacted similar businesses. Do you anticipate any similar policy challenges in Myanmar? And what might be similar risks in your market? 
Yeah, I definitely am aware of that, especially in Rwanda. Um, what has happened around the world, there have been other plastic bag bans, especially of grocery store bans in other countries. But unfortunately, what that typically does is push the um, sales of um, garbage bags because people will typically use, you know, the thin gar carrier bags as your garbage bag. And garbage bags actually use more plastic. Um, and so it's kind of a weird, ironic situation. Um, and unfortunately, as I shared, plastic industry plastic packaging industry is a $200 billion industry and COVID has only accelerated that growth. They were already going to be accelerating that growth, but with the advent of e-commerce, um, it's just exploding, unfortunately. Um, but we're looking at hopefully applications to add more post-consumer plastic into these items um, and, and, you know, looking to some really interesting companies, one of my fellows actually as well, um, who are trying to make um, plastic list packaging. So trying to find other sustainable ways of, of packaging things. Yeah. But uh, from a personal side, I would really love to see no plastic. That it, and then from a company side, we're also, that's our mission as well. That's our vision. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. And there, there are some from the Cardi Women's Initiative Network who are also working on, on, on this big problem. So I'll make sure mm -hmm. to connect you with, with all of them. So, well, um, thank you so much, Mimi, for your presentation and all your answers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so I, I wanted to thank all our founders, all our six founders today who, are, um, on, who have shared about their companies, their solutions, and the problems that they are tackling. So um, I would invite all of you who participated um, in this session today to visit the virtual booth of our fellows. Um, on the Sankalp Global Summit um, platform and network with our founders. So our founders, they have also shared their contact details with you and some of them have shared their social media channels. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to uh, discuss a partnership with them or you're interested in offering any type of support um, to uh, their companies. So thank you once again for joining this session. I would love to connect with any of you who are interested in supporting women impact entrepreneurs from around the world. And uh, I look forward to um, hosting a female founder showcase at next year's Sankal Global Summit as well. Thank you so much.